This is a Fox News special presentation. And good evening from Washington, where we're minutes away from President Obama's State of the Union address to the nation, his first ever before Republican-led Congress. I'm Shepard Smith, live at the Russell Rotunda on Capitol Hill. Spoiler alert, the shadow of crisis has passed and the state of our union is strong. The president will say that just minutes from now. A live look at the House chamber where we're expecting to see the president at any moment. The White House has released his prepared remarks. First time they've ever done this. And if he sticks to the script, the president will ask Congress to lift the U.S. trade embargo against Cuba. He's already eased travel restrictions, making it easier for Americans to visit the island nation. Officials say he's done all he can do on his own. According to the prepared remarks, which you can see at the White House website right now, if you so choose, the president will say that we have risen from recession. But the president will be speaking to a nation that apparently does have concerns about the state of our union. A recent Fox News, opinion, a Fox News poll, I should say, shows almost 60 percent of Americans say they are not satisfied with how things are going. According to the prepared speech, the president will say, and I quote, it has been and still is a hard time for many. But tonight, we turn the page. Every year, one cabinet member stays away from the Capitol during the State of the Union address, just in case. This year's so-called designated survivor, their words, not mine, is the Transportation Secretary, Anthony Fox. And a side note, if you will, uh, the host of The Five over on Fox News Channel will be live tweeting during the speech tonight, which could be entertaining. Uh, you can join them on all the fun at hashtag Fox News Chat. The sergeant at arms is about to introduce the president. Uh, we'll do so in just a moment. Chris Wallace from Fox News Sunday is with us, releasing the speech in advance so the world can read it before the president delivers it. I think I like it. <laughs> well, I hope that they'll watch us instead of reading the speech, although they can read along with us during the speech. You know, Shep, it's so interesting. It was just two and a half months ago that the president suffered a, a terrible defeat in the midterm elections. The president and Democrats, they lost even more seats in the House. They lost control of the Senate. Uh, and yet the White House feels they're dealing from a position of strength coming into the State of the Union, uh, the economy. There have been signs of, of progress. Uh, growth is up. Unemployment is down. Gas prices are way down. Mm -hmm. uh, and the president's approval ratings are up. In fact, there's a new poll today that shows him at 50 percent support. That's up about a half dozen points in just the last month or so. And so it's interesting, as you point out, he's in a sense going to declare victory today, even though we're still fighting the war on terror, even though, as you say, a lot of people aren't feeling that we are out of the recession session, he's going to say it's time to turn the page uh, and challenge Republicans to follow his agenda, not try to agree with them and try to find areas of compromise, but to follow his agenda, which calls for more tax increases on the wealthy, tax cuts uh, and more spending, community, free community college for the middle class and working class. I will tell you there are a lot of Republicans, Shep, who are not happy with this, say that it's a political document, not a policy document, and that it's dead on arrival even before it's been delivered or people have had a chance to read it online. I think this is the first State of the Union address that I've covered where we knew just about every single thing that was going to come out. And that was done by design by this White House. Much of the policy initiatives that have been announced over the last few days will be discussed here again tonight. And from a quick read through the speech, which you can do as well, uh, if there's anything new, I haven't found it. Uh, the, the nods toward Cuba are noticeable. And today the White House had a, an off-the-record lunch, as it does for the, those who are going to be anchoring this, this broadcast tonight. And it was very clear, it was off the record, but I can tell you by, by way of observation that it's very clear that they are going to be very positive tonight, uh, accentuate the things that have gone well in the president's tenure, and make the point that the, the president is not going to let the things that have gone well be turned around by a lack of legislative attention. Uh, I, it's, it seems very clear to anyone who will read this speech that, that the president has made some decisions and to the degree that it's possible he's going to stick to them. Well, absolutely. And, you know, he, he took all these executive actions, three major executive actions on, on climate change and immigration uh, and seven veto threats in the first two weeks of this new Congress. This is a president who is willing and ready to go it alone. Uh, over the heads of this Republican Congress. Sergeant at Arms to announce the President's arrival. Now let's listen.
they, he arrived early, and they had expected that he would have walked into the hall about three minutes ago. And then about a minute ago, we got a 30-second notice. So uh, if anything, those of us who are involved with the presentation of the president's event, if there's anything we've learned over the last six months is that we are on Obama standard time. And now here he is. United States. The White House, uh, talking about the president's wardrobe, the White House uh, tweeted earlier suggesting to us that the president uh, might wear tan tonight. Uh, they sent out a tweet that said, yes, we tan, uh, with a nod to Cisse Puede from back to campaign days, and had a picture of a tan suit there, and Chris Wallace looked at it and said, no, he will not. <laughs> well, if he had, we'd be talking about the suit tonight instead of his policy message. Uh, it, it is interesting. That, of course, was the suit that he wore this summer uh, when he said we didn't yet have a strategy for fighting ISIS and he came under heat for the comments and for the wardrobe. Uh, he obviously is sticking to a more conservative and I guess you'd say presidential wardrobe. Can, can I just say, I, I, I point this out every, every time, but I'm always fascinated by it. The people on both sides of the aisle are known informally as aisle hogs and they literally get there early, these members of Congress, hours ahead of time just so they can be there they can exchange words for the president not so coincidentally they can be seen on camera exchanging words for the president and they literally sit there in those chosen seats on the aisle for hours uh, just so they can get this moment of up close and personal with the president and with the tv audience my father does that as well for Ole Miss football games he has to get there three hours early to get a good seat uh, they will be. There is no equality in this. You come early, you get you get the seats. If you don't, you don't. Tonight, much of the speech is about inequality, though the president doesn't use that word as much as he used to. He seems convinced that one thing that has to happen is, as Republicans would put it, some some income redistribution. That the one percent who, according to some recent numbers, may have 50 percent of all the wealth uh, within the next 10 years or so. Uh, he, he believes that the middle class is where it's at, and he wants to take more money from the rich and put it on the middle class, and he's determined to do it if possible, and it looks to me as if it's not possible. No, that's right. And, and you know, I, both sides, it's interesting. He's going to come off tonight, try to come off as the champion of the middle class. Uh, Republicans are going to offer their own programs for the middle class, but they say the way to do it is not by uh, raising taxes on a lot of the people that... Uh, that provide the jobs and the investment for uh, a good economy, uh, that the way to do it is by, in fact, an offer, uh, cutting back on regulation, cutting back on government's role, and letting the free enterprise system work. Uh, Can I also say, just uh, parenthetically, does the president look a lot grayer to you than... I, I was just going to mention that. Today, I, I've been going to these lunches now throughout his presidency and before, and today, he, he was grayer than I've ever seen him. I don't know if they just don't use product up there. Or if, if I know that the job is tough, we've seen it on the last three presidents. I, I think if you were to look at him from six years ago, you'd be shocked at the difference in, in, in how he looks. Yeah, I think if you or I went back and looked at tape from six years ago of a broadcast or two, we might be equally shocked. But we have very good makeup on it. Wow. That was kind of harsh. Well, I think the president's <laughs> mic fell off. Did you notice that? Oh, Chris's mic fell off. They're telling you. Like, why is the president wearing a microphone? So there's a lot of pomp and circumstance now. There'll be some more. We'll tell you about who's, who's with the First Lady and the rest in just a moment. Uh, there'll be more introductions now because you can never have enough introductions in Washington. And then what looks like a lengthy speech. Members of Congress, I have the high privilege and distinct honor of presenting to you the President of the United States. Thank you, 
so much. And Speaker Boehner. Thank you. Thank you so much. Please. Well, look, the, they're doing a lot of new things, including his first interview afterwards Speaker, is with Mr. Vice President, the social media groups. Members of Congress, my fellow Americans. We are 15 years into this new century. 15 years that dawned with terror touching our shores, that unfolded with a new generation fighting two long and costly wars, that saw a vicious recession spread across our nation and the world. It has been, and still is, a hard time for many. But tonight, we turn the page. Tonight, after a breakthrough year for America, our economy is growing and creating jobs at the fastest pace since 1999. Employment rate is now lower than it was before the financial crisis. More of our kids are graduating than ever before. More of our people are insured than ever before. And we are as free from the grip of foreign oil as we've been in almost 30 years. Tonight, for the first time since 9-11, our combat mission in Afghanistan is over. Six years ago, nearly 180,000 American troops served in Iraq and Afghanistan. Today, fewer than 15,000 remain. And we salute the courage and sacrifice of every man and woman in this 9-11 generation who has served to keep us safe. We are humbled and grateful for your service. America, for all that we have endured, for all the grit and hard work required to come back, for all the tasks that lie ahead, know this, the shadow of crisis has passed and the state of the union is strong. At this moment, with a growing economy, shrinking deficits, bustling industry, booming energy production, we have risen from recession freer to write our own future than any other nation on earth. It's now up to us to choose who we want to be over the next 15 years and for decades to come. Will we accept an economy where only a few of us do spectacularly well? Or will we commit ourselves to an economy that generates rising incomes and chances for everyone who makes the effort? Will we approach the world fearful and reactive, dragged into costly conflicts that strain our military and set back our standing? Or will we lead wisely using all elements of our power to defeat new threats and protect our planet? Will we allow ourselves to be sorted into factions and turned against one another? 
Or will we recapture the sense of common purpose that has always propelled America forward? In two weeks, I will send this Congress a budget filled with ideas that are practical, not partisan. And in the months ahead, I'll crisscross the country making a case for those ideas. So tonight, I want to focus less on a checklist of proposals and focus more on the values at stake in the choices before us. It begins with our economy. Seven years ago, Rebecca and Ben Erler of Minneapolis were newlyweds. <laughs> she waited tables. He worked construction. Their first child, Jack, was on the way. They were young and in love in America. And it doesn't get much better than that. If only we had known, Rebecca wrote to me last spring, what was about to happen to the housing and construction market. As the crisis worsened, Ben's business dried up. So he took what jobs he could find, even if they kept him on the road for long stretches of time. Rebecca took out student loans and enrolled in community college and retrained for a new career. They sacrificed for each other. And slowly it paid off. They bought their first home. They had a second son, Henry. Rebecca got a better job and then a raise. Ben's back in construction and home for dinner every night. It is amazing, Rebecca wrote, what you can bounce back from when you have to. We are a strong, tight-knit family who has made it through some very, very hard times. We are a strong, tight-knit family who has made it through some very, very hard times. America, Rebecca and Ben's story is our story. They represent the millions who've worked hard and scrimped and sacrificed and retooled. You are the reason that I ran for this office. You are the people I was thinking of six years ago today in the darkest months of the crisis, when I stood on the steps of this Capitol and promised we would rebuild our economy on a new foundation. And it has been your resilience, your effort, that has made it possible for our country to emerge stronger. We believed we could reverse the tide of outsourcing and draw new jobs to our shores. And over the past five years, our businesses have created more than 11 million new jobs. We believed we could reduce our dependence on foreign oil and protect our planet. And today, America is number one in oil and gas. America is number one in wind power. Every three weeks, we bring online as much solar power as we did in all of 2008. And thanks to lower gas prices and higher fuel standards, the typical family this year should save about $750 at the pump. We believed we could prepare our kids for a more competitive world. And today, our younger students have earned the highest math and reading scores on record. Our high school graduation rate has hit an all-time high. More Americans finish college than ever before. We believed that sensible regulations could prevent another crisis, shield families from ruin, and encourage fair competition. Today, we have new tools to stop taxpayer-funded bailouts and a new consumer watchdog to protect us from predatory lending and abusive credit card practices. And in the past year alone, about 10 million uninsured Americans finally gained the security of health coverage.
At every step, we were told our goals were misguided or too ambitious, that we would crush jobs and explode deficits. Instead, we've seen the fastest economic growth in over a decade, our deficits cut by two-thirds, a stock market that has doubled, and healthcare inflation at its lowest rate in 50 years. This is good news, people. <laughs> so, so, so the verdict is clear. Middle class economics works. Expanding opportunity works. And these policies will continue to work as long as politics don't get in the way. We can't slow down businesses or put our economy at risk with government shutdowns or fiscal showdowns. We can't put the security of families at risk by taking away their health insurance or unraveling the new rules on Wall Street or refighting past battles on immigration when we've got to fix a broken system. And if a bill comes to my desk that tries to do any of these things, I will veto it. It will have earned my veto. Today, thanks to a growing economy, the recovery is touching more and more lives. Wages are finally starting to rise again. We know that more small business owners plan to raise their employees' pay than at any time since 2007. But here's the thing. Those of us here tonight, we need to set our sights higher than just making sure government doesn't screw things up. The government doesn't halt the progress we're making. We need to do more than just do no harm. Tonight, together, let's do more to restore the link between hard work and growing opportunity for every American. Because families like Rebecca's still need our help. She and Ben are working as hard as ever, but they've had to forego vacations and a new car so that they can pay off student loans and save for retirement. Friday night pizza, that's a big splurge. Basic childcare for Jack and Henry costs more than their mortgage and almost as much as a year at the University of Minnesota. Like millions of hardworking Americans, Rebecca isn't asking for a handout, but she is asking that we look for more ways to help families get ahead. And in fact, at every moment of economic change throughout our history, this country has taken bold action to adapt to new circumstances and to make sure everyone gets a fair shot. We set up worker protections, Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, to protect ourselves from the harshest adversity. We gave our citizens schools and colleges, infrastructure and the internet, tools they needed to go as far as their efforts and their dreams will take them. That's what middle class economics is. The idea that this country does best when everyone gets their fair shot. Everyone does their fair share. Everyone plays by the same set of rules. We don't just want everyone to share in America's success, we want everyone to contribute to our success. So, so what does middle class economics require in our time? First, middle class economics means helping working families feel more secure in a world of constant change. That means helping folks afford childcare, college, healthcare, a home, retirement. And my budget will address each of these issues 
lowering the taxes of working families and putting thousands of dollars back into their pockets each year. Here, here's one example. During World War II, when men like my grandfather went off to war, having women like my grandmother in the workforce was a national security priority. So this country provided universal child care. In today's economy, when having both parents in the workforce is an economic necessity for many families, we need affordable, high-quality child care more than ever. It's not a nice to have, it's a must have. So it's time we stop treating childcare as a side issue or as a women's issue and treat it like the national economic priority that it is for all of us. And that's why, that's why my plan will make quality child care more available and more affordable for every middle class and low income family with young children in America by creating more slots and a new tax cut of up to $3,000 per child per year. Here's another example. Uh, today we are the only advanced country on earth that doesn't guarantee paid sick leave or paid maternity leave to our workers. 43 million workers have no paid sick leave. 43 million. Think about that. And that forces too many parents to make the gut-wrenching choice between a paycheck and a sick kid at home. So I'll be taking new action to help states adopt paid leave laws of their own. And since paid sick leave won where it was on the ballot last November, let's put it to a vote right here in Washington. Send me a bill that gives every worker in America the opportunity to earn seven days of paid sick leave. That's the right thing to do. It's the right thing to do. Of course, nothing helps families make ends meet like higher wages. That's why this Congress still needs to pass a law that makes sure a woman is paid the same as a man for doing the same work. I Missed. Mean, it's, it's 2015. It's time. We still need to make sure employees get the overtime they've earned. And, and everyone in this Congress who still refuses to raise the minimum wage, I say this. If you truly believe you could work full time and support a family on less than $15,000 a year, try it. If not, vote to give millions of the hardest working people in America a raise. Now, these ideas won't make everybody rich, won't relieve every hardship. That's not the job of government. To give working families a fair shot, we still need more employers to see beyond next quarter's earnings and recognize that investing in their workforce is in their company's long-term interest. We still need laws that strengthen rather than weaken unions and give American workers a voice. But, but, you know, things like child care and sick leave and equal pay, things like lower mortgage premiums and a higher minimum wage, these ideas will make a meaningful difference in the lives of millions of families. That's a fact. And that's what all of us. Republicans and Democrats alike were sent here to do. And second, 
to make sure folks keep earning higher wages down the road, we have to do more to help Americans upgrade their skills. You know, America thrived in the 20th century because we made high school free, sent a generation of GIs to college, trained the best workforce in the world. We were ahead of the curve. But other countries caught on. And in a 21st century economy that rewards knowledge like never before, we need to up our game. We need to do more. By the end of this decade, two in three job openings will require some higher education. Two in three. And yet we still live in a country where too many bright, striving Americans are priced out of the education they need. It's not fair to them, and it's sure not smart for our future. And that's why I'm sending this Congress a bold new plan to lower the cost of community college to zero. Keep in mind, 40 percent of our college students choose community college. Some are young and starting out. Some are older and looking for a better job. Some are veterans and single parents trying to transition back into the job market. Whoever you are, this plan is your chance to graduate ready for the new economy without a load of debt. Understand you've got to earn it. You've got to keep your grades up and graduate on time. Tennessee, a state with Republican leadership, and Chicago, a city with Democratic leadership, are showing that free community college is possible. And I want to spread that idea all across America so that two years of college becomes as free and universal in America as high school is today. Let's stay ahead of the curve. And, and I want to work with this Congress to make sure those already burdened with student loans can reduce their monthly payments so that student debt doesn't derail anyone's dreams. Thanks to Vice President Biden's great work to update our job training system, we're connecting community colleges with local employers to train workers to fill high-paying jobs like coding and nursing and robotics. Tonight, I'm also asking more businesses to follow the lead of companies like CVS and UPS and offer more educational benefits and paid apprenticeships, opportunities that give workers the chance to earn higher-paying jobs, even if they don't have a higher education. And as a new generation of veterans comes home, we owe them every opportunity to live the American dream they helped defend. Already, we've made strides towards ensuring that every veteran has access to the highest quality care. We're slashing the backlog that had too many veterans waiting years to get the benefits they need. And we're making it easier for vets to translate their training and experience into civilian jobs. And joining forces, the national campaign launched by Michelle and Jill Biden. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you, Jill. Has helped nearly 700,000 veterans and military spouses get a new job. So to every CEO in America, let me repeat, if you want somebody who's going to get the job done and done right, hire a veteran. Finally. As we better train our workers, we need the new economy to keep churning out high-wage jobs for our workers to fill. Since 2010, America has put more people back to work than Europe, Japan, and all advanced economies combined. Our manufacturers have added almost 800,000 new jobs. Some of our bedrock sectors, like our auto industry, are booming. 
But there are also millions of Americans who work in jobs that didn't even exist 10 or 20 years ago. Jobs at companies like Google and eBay and Tesla. So no one knows for certain which industries will generate the jobs of the future. But we do know we want them here in America. We know that. And that's why the third part of middle class economics is all about building the most competitive economy anywhere, the place where businesses want to locate and hire. 21st century businesses need 21st century infrastructure, modern ports and stronger bridges, faster trains, and the fastest internet. Democrats and Republicans used to agree on this. So let's set our sights higher than a single oil pipeline. Let's pass a bipartisan infrastructure plan that could create more than 30 times as many jobs per year and make this country stronger for decades to come. Let's do it. Let's get it done. Let's get it done. 21st century businesses, including small businesses, need to sell more American products overseas. Today, our businesses export more than ever, and exporters tend to pay their workers higher wages. But as we speak, China wants to write the rules for the world's fastest growing region. That would put our workers and our businesses at a disadvantage. Why would we let that happen? We should write those rules. We should level the playing field. And that's why I'm asking both parties to give me trade promotion authority to protect American workers with strong new trade deals from Asia to Europe that aren't just free, but are also fair. It's the right thing to do. Look, I'm, I'm the first one to admit I'm the first one to admit that past trade deals haven't always lived up to the hype. And that's why we've gone after countries that break the rules at our expense. But 95% of the world's customers live outside our borders. We can't close ourselves off from those opportunities. More than half of manufacturing executives have said they're acti actively looking to bring jobs back from China. So let's give them one more reason to get it done. 21st century businesses will rely on American science and technology, research and development. I want the country that eliminated polio and mapped the human genome to lead a new era of medicine, one that delivers the right treatment at the right time. In some patients with cystic fibrosis, this approach has reversed a disease once thought unstoppable. So tonight, I'm launching a new precision medicine initiative to bring us closer to curing diseases like cancer and diabetes, and to give all of us access to the personalized information we need to keep ourselves and our families healthier. We can do this. I intend to protect a free and open internet extend its reach to every classroom in every community, and help folks build the fastest networks so that the next generation of digital innovators and entrepreneurs have the platform to keep reshaping our world. I want Americans to win the race for the kinds of discoveries that unleash new jobs, converting sunlight into liquid fuel, creating revolutionary prosthetics so that a veteran who gave his arms for his country can play catch with his kids again pushing out into the solar system, not just to visit, but to stay. Now, last month, we launched a new spacecraft as part of a re-energized space program that will send American astronauts to Mars. And in two months, to prepare us for those missions, Scott Kelly will begin a year-long stay in space. So good luck, Captain. Make sure to Instagram it. We're proud of it.
Now, the truth is, when it comes to issues like infrastructure and basic research, I know there's bipartisan support in this chamber. Members of both parties have told me so. Where we too often run onto the rocks is how to pay for these investments. As Americans, we don't mind paying our fair share of taxes as long as everybody else does too. But for far too long, lobbyists have rigged the tax code with loopholes that let some corporations pay nothing while others pay full freight. They've riddled it with giveaways that the super rich don't need while denying a break to middle class families who do. This year we have an opportunity to change that. Let's close loopholes so we stop rewarding companies that keep profits abroad and reward those that invest here in America. Let's use those savings to rebuild our infrastructure and to make it more attractive for companies to bring jobs home. Let's simplify the system and let a small business owner file based on her actual bank statement instead of the number of accountants she can afford. And let's close the loopholes that lead to inequality by allowing the top 1% to avoid paying taxes on their accumulated wealth. We can use that money to help more families pay for childcare and send their kids to college. We need a tax code that truly helps working Americans trying to get a leg up in the new economy. And we can achieve that together. We can achieve it together. Helping hardworking families make ends meet. Giving them the tools they need for good paying jobs in this new economy. Maintaining the conditions of growth and competitiveness. This is where America needs to go. I believe it's where the American people want to go. It'll make our economy stronger a year from now, 15 years from now, and deep into the century ahead. Of course, if there's one thing this new century has taught us, is that we cannot separate our work here at home from challenges beyond our shores. My first duty as Commander-in-Chief is to defend the United States of America. In doing so, the question is not in doing so, the question is not whether America leads in the world, but how. When we make rash decisions, reacting to the headlines instead of using our heads, when the first response to a challenge is to send in our military, then we risk getting drawn into unnecessary conflicts and neglect the broader strategy we need for a safer, more prosperous world. That's what our enemies want us to do. I believe in a smarter, kind of American leadership. We lead best when we combine military power with strong diplomacy, when we leverage our power with coalition building, when we don't let our fears blind us to the opportunities that this new century presents. That's exactly what we're doing right now. And around the globe, it is making a difference. First, we stand united with people around the world who have been targeted by terrorists, from a school in Pakistan to the streets of Paris. We will continue to hunt down terrorists and dismantle their networks, and we reserve the right to act unilaterally, as we have done relentlessly since I took office, to take out terrorists who pose a direct threat to us and our allies. At the same time, we've learned some costly lessons over the last 13 years. Instead of Americans patrolling the valleys of Afghanistan, we've trained their security forces, who've now taken the lead. And we've honored our troops' sacrifice by supporting that country's first democratic transition. Instead of sending large ground forces overseas, we're partnering with nations from South Asia to North Africa to deny safe haven to terrorists who threaten America. In Iraq and Syria, American leadership, including our military power, is stopping ISIL's advance. 
Instead of getting dragged into another ground war in the Middle East, we are leading a broad coalition, including Arab nations, to degrade and ultimately destroy this terrorist group. We're also supporting a moderate opposition in Syria that can help us in this effort and assisting people everywhere who stand up to the bankrupt ideology of violent extremism. Now, this effort will take time. It will require focus. But we will succeed. And tonight, I call on this Congress to show the world that we are united in this mission by passing a resolution to authorize the use of force against ISIL. We need that authority. Second, we're demonstrating the power of American strength and diplomacy. We're upholding the principle that bigger nations can't bully the small by opposing Russian aggression and supporting Ukraine's democracy and reassuring our NATO allies. Last year, as we were doing the hard work of imposing sanctions along with our allies, as we were reinforcing our presence with the frontline states, Mr. Putin's aggression, uh, it was suggested, was a masterful display of strategy and strength. That's what I heard from some folks. Well, today, it is America that stands strong and united with our allies, while Russia is isolated with its economy in tatters. That's how America leads, not with bluster, but with persistent, steady resolve. You know, in Cuba, we are ending a policy that was long past its expiration date. When what you're doing doesn't work for 50 years, it's time to try something new. And our, our shift in Cuba policy has the potential to end a legacy of mistrust in our hemisphere. It removes a phony excuse for restrictions in Cuba, stands up for democratic values, and extends the hand of friendship to the Cuban people. And this year, Congress should begin the work of ending the embargo. You know, as As His Holiness Pope Francis has said, diplomacy is the work of small steps. And these small steps have added up to new hope for the future in Cuba. And after years in prison, we are overjoyed that Alan Gross is back where he belongs. Welcome home, Alan. We're glad you're here. Our diplomacy is at work with respect to Iran, where for the first time in a decade, we've halted the progress of its nuclear program and reduced its stockpile of nuclear material. Between now and this spring, we have a chance to negotiate a comprehensive agreement that prevents a nuclear-armed Iran, secures America and our allies, including Israel, while avoiding yet another Middle East conflict. There are no guarantees that negotiations will succeed. And I keep all options on the table to prevent a nuclear run. But new sanctions passed by this Congress at this moment in time will all but guarantee that diplomacy fails, alienating America from its allies, making it harder to maintain sanctions, and ensuring that Iran starts up its nuclear program again. It doesn't make sense. And that's why I will veto any new sanctions bill that threatens to undo this progress. The American people expect us only to go to war as a last resort. And I intend to stay true to that wisdom. 
Third, we're looking beyond the issues that have consumed us in the past to shape the coming century. No foreign nation, no hacker, should be able to shut down our networks, steal our trade secrets, or invade the privacy of American families, especially our kids. So we're making sure our government integrates intelligence to combat cyber threats, just as we have done to combat terrorism. And tonight, I urge this Congress to finally pass the legislation we need to better meet the evolving threat of cyber attacks, combat identity theft, and protect our children's information. That should be a bipartisan effort. You know, if we don't act, we'll leave our nation and our economy vulnerable. If we do, we can continue to protect the technologies that have unleashed untold opportunities for people around the globe. In West Africa, our troops, our scientists, our doctors, our nurses, our health care workers are rolling back Ebola, saving countless lives and stopping the spread of disease. I could not be prouder of them. And I thank this Congress for your bipartisan support of their efforts. But the job is not yet done, and the world needs to use this lesson to build a more effective global effort to prevent the spread of future pandemics, invest in smart development, and eradicate extreme poverty. In the Asia Pacific, we are modernizing alliances while making sure that other nations play by the rules in how they trade, how they resolve maritime disputes, how they participate in meeting common international challenges like nonproliferation and disaster relief. And no challenge, no challenge poses a greater threat to future generations than climate change. Two thousand and fourteen was the planet's warmest year on record. Now one year doesn't make a trend, but this does. Fourteen of the fifteen warmest years on record have all fallen in the first fifteen years of this century. Now, I've heard some folks try to dodge the evidence by saying they're not scientists, that we don't have enough information to act. Well, you know, I'm not a scientist either. But you know what? I know a lot of really good scientists at NASA and at NOAA and at our major universities. And the best scientists in the world are all telling us that our activities are changing the climate. And if we don't act forcefully, we'll continue to see rising oceans, longer, hotter heat waves, dangerous droughts and floods, and massive disruptions that can trigger greater migration and conflict and hunger around the globe. The Pentagon says that climate change poses immediate risks to our national security. We should act like it. And that's why That's why over the past 6 years we've done more than ever to to combat climate change from the way we produce energy to the way we use it. That's why we've set aside more public lands and waters than any administration in history. And that's why I will not let this Congress endanger the health of our children by turning back the clock on our efforts. I am determined to make sure that American leadership drives international action. In Beijing, we made a historic announcement. The United States will double the pace at which we cut carbon pollution, and China committed for the first time to limiting their emissions. And because the world's two largest economies came together, other nations are now stepping up and offering hope that this year the world will finally reach an agreement to protect the one planet we've got. And there's one last pillar of our leadership, and that's the example of our values. 
As Americans, we respect human dignity even when we're threatened, which is why I have prohibited torture and worked to make sure our use of new technology like drones is properly constrained. It's why we speak out against the deplorable anti-Semitism that has resurfaced in certain parts of the world. It's why we continue to reject offensive stereotypes of Muslims, the vast majority of whom share our commitment to peace. That's why we defend free speech and advocate for political prisoners and condemn the persecution of women or religious minorities, or people who are lesbian, gay, bisexual, or transgender. We do these things not only because they are the right thing to do, but because ultimately they will make us safer. As Americans, we have a profound commitment to justice. So it makes no sense to spend $3 million per prisoner to keep open a prison that the world condemns and terrorists use to recruit. Since I've been president, we've worked responsibly to cut the population of Gitmo in half. Now it is time to finish the job, and I will not relent in my determination to shut it down. It is not who we are. It's time to close Gitmo. As Americans, we cherish our civil liberties. And we need to uphold that commitment if we want maximum cooperation from other countries and industry in our fight against terrorist networks. So while some have moved on from the debates over our surveillance programs, I have not. As promised, our intelligence agencies have worked hard with the recommendations of privacy advocates to increase transparency and build more safeguards against potential abuse. And next month, we'll issue a report on how we're keeping our promise to keep our country safe while strengthening privacy. Looking to the future instead of the past. Making sure we match our power with diplomacy and use force wisely. <coughs> Building coalitions to meet new challenges and opportunities. Leading always with the example of our values. That's what makes us exceptional. That's what keeps us strong. That's why we have to keep striving to hold ourselves to the highest of standards, our own. You know, just over a decade ago, I gave a speech in Boston where I said there wasn't a liberal America or a conservative America, a black America or a white America, but a United States of America. I said this because I had seen it in my own life, in a nation that gave someone like me a chance. Because I grew up in Hawaii, a melting pot of races and customs. Because I made Illinois my home, a state of small towns, rich farmland, one of the world's great cities, a microcosm of the country where Democrats and Republicans and independents, good people, of every ethnicity and every faith share certain bedrock values. Over the past six years, the pundits have pointed out more than once that my presidency hasn't delivered on this vision. How ironic, they say, that our politics seems more divided than ever. It's held up as proof, not just of my own flaws, of which there are many, but also as proof that the vision itself is misguided, naive, that there are too many people in this town who actually benefit from partisanship and gridlock for us to ever do anything about it. I know how tempting such cynicism may be, but I still think the cynics are wrong. I still believe that we are one people. I still believe that together we can do great things, even when the odds are long. I believe this 
because over and over in my six years in office, I have seen America at its best. I've seen the hopeful faces of young graduates from New York to California, and our newest officers at West Point, Annapolis, Colorado Springs, New London. I've mourned with grieving families in Tucson and Newtown, in Boston, in West Texas, in West Virginia. I've watched Americans beat back adversity from the Gulf Coast to the Great Plains, from Midwest assembly lines to the Mid-Atlantic seaboard. I've seen something like gay marriage go from a wedge issue used to drive us apart to a story of freedom across our country, a civil right now legal in states that seven in 10 Americans call home. So, so I know the good an optimistic and big-hearted generosity of the American people who every day live the idea that we are our brother's keeper and our sister's keeper. And I know they expect those of us who serve here to set a better example. So the question for those of us here tonight is how we, all of us, can better reflect America's hopes. I've served in Congress with many of you. I know many of you well. There are a lot of good people here on both sides of the aisle. And many of you have told me that this isn't what you signed up for. Arguing past each other on cable shows, the constant fundraising, always looking over your shoulder at how the base will react to every decision. Imagine if we broke out of these tired old patterns. Imagine if we did something different. Understand, a better politics isn't one where Democrats abandon their agenda or, or Republicans simply embrace mine. A better politics is one where we appeal to each other's basic decency instead of our basest fears. A better politics is one where we debate without demonizing each other where we talk issues and values and principles and facts rather than gotcha moments or trivial gaffes or fake controversies that have nothing to do with people's daily lives. A politics, a better politics is one where we spend less time drowning in dark money for ads that pull us into the gutter and spend more time lifting young people up with a sense of purpose and possibility, asking them to join in the great mission of building America. If we're going to have arguments, let's have arguments, but let's make them debates worthy of this body and worthy of this country. We still may not agree on a woman's right to choose, but surely we can agree it's a good thing that teen pregnancies and abortions are nearing all-time lows and that every woman should have access to the health care that she needs. Yes, passions still fly on immigration, but surely we can all see something of ourselves in the striving young student and agree that no one benefits when a hard-working mom is snatched from her child, and then it's possible to shape a law that upholds our tradition as a nation of laws and a nation of immigrants. I've talked to Republicans and Democrats about that. That's something that we can share. We may go at it in campaign season. But surely we can agree that the right to vote is sacred, that it's being denied to too many, and that on this 50th anniversary of the great march from Selma to Montgomery and the passage of the Voting Rights Act, we can come together, Democrats and Republicans, to make voting easier for every single American. We may have different takes on the events of Ferguson and New York. But 
Surely we can understand a father who fears his son can't walk home without being harassed. And surely we can understand the wife who won't rest until the police officer she married walks through the front door at the end of his shift. And surely we can agree that it's a good thing that for the first time in 40 years, the crime rate and the incarceration rate have come down together and use that as a starting point for Democrats and Republicans, community leaders and law enforcement to reform America's criminal justice system so that it protects and serves all of us. That's a better politics. That's how we start rebuilding trust. That's how we move this country forward. That's what the American people want. And that's what they deserve. I have no more campaigns to run. My only agenda, I know because I won both of them. My only agenda for the next two years is the same as the one I've had since the day I swore an oath on the steps of this Capitol, to do what I believe is best for America. If you share the broad vision I outlined tonight, I ask you to join me in the work at hand. If you disagree with parts of it, I hope you'll at least work with me where you do agree. And I commit to every Republican here tonight that I will not only seek out your ideas, I will seek to work with you to make this country stronger. Because, because I want this chamber, I want this city to reflect the truth that for all our blind spots and shortcomings, we are a people with the strength and generosity of spirit to bridge divides, to unite in common effort, to help our neighbors, whether down the street or on the other side of the world. I want our actions to tell every child in every neighborhood, your life matters. And we are committed to improving your life chances, as committed as we are to, to working on behalf of our own kids. I want future generations to know that we are a people who see our differences as a great gift. That we're a people who value the dignity and worth of every citizen. Man and woman, young and old, black and white, Latino, Asian, immigrant, Native American, gay, straight, Americans with mental illness or physical disability. Everybody matters. I want, I want them to grow up in a country that shows the world what we still know to be true, that we are still more than a collection of red states and blue states, that we are the United States of America. I want them to grow up in a country where a young mom can sit down and write a letter to her president with a story that sums up these past six years. It's amazing what you can bounce back from when you have to. We are a strong, tight-knit family who's made it through some very, very hard times. My fellow Americans, we too are a strong, tight-knit family. We, too, have made it through some hard times. Fifteen years into this new century, we have picked ourselves up, dusted ourselves off, and begun again the work of remaking America. We have laid a new foundation. A brighter future is ours to write. Let's begin this new chapter together. And let's start the work right now. Thank you. God bless you. God bless this country we love. Thank you.
An optimistic President Obama with the State of the Union tonight. Uh, Shepard Smith in Washington, where we just heard matters of mutual agreement at the end, uh, a bit of inspiration, if you will, uh, if, the, if he is the one who you'd like to listen to. Uh, either way, the, the words there certainly inspiring. The beginning, though, of the President reminding us that this has been a breakthrough year for America, that unemployment is lower. Uh, that more of our kids are graduating, more of us are insured, the economy is growing, and in short, the shadow of crisis has passed, the state of the union is strong. So he went on to say, let's do this. Deep breath, child care for all, make sick leave mandated, give men and women the same pay, let's raise the minimum wage, let's have free community college for everyone, let's reduce student loan debt, let's fix the infrastructure, let's pass new trade deals with Asia and Europe, let's close tax loopholes for the rich and fix the tax code, let's lead in the world not with bluster but with persistent steady resolve, let's increase cyber security, let's address climate change, it is real and it's our fault, and Gitmo is wrong, it's time to close it down. It's going to be a busy year, America. Chris Wallace, the host of Fox News Sunday, is with me. If we do all of that, it's going to be a very busy year, but Republicans have suggested none of that will happen. Well, it, it's, it may be not none of it, but m certainly not most of it. I thought it was a better State of the Union speech than usual. The president said it was not going to be a laundry list. It was going to be more thematic, built around this quite touching story about the Erler family of Minis Minneapolis. Uh, I thought it was, it, it was effective, and as you say, the president called for a number of specific things like the child care tax credit, community college, uh, and I think to some degree the Republicans didn't look too good sitting on their hands while the president was talking about kind of apple pie proposals. Uh, the problem, of course, is that on page seven, late in page seven of a 14-page speech, the president got around to talking about how do we pay for this? Mm. Uh, and uh, he only devoted a couple of paragraphs to that after seven pages of, of all kinds of treats that he was going to deliver. Uh, and it was and, and kind of sloughed over the fact that he's calling for three hundred and twenty billion dollars in new taxes and in on the wealthy and uh, new fees on big banks, uh, which are simply not acceptable to Republicans. Uh, and the president talked about a better politics, uh, and, and you, that was his impassioned and uh, quite eloquent plea at the very end of his speech. But having said that, he really didn't, it seemed to me, in any way reach out to the Republicans. He didn't seem in any way to, to recognize or to react to the fact that here is a man who said last fall that his agenda was on the ballot, uh, and he took a drubbing in the election. He and the Democrats, they lost the Senate. They lost more seats in the House. Uh, and, and there really was no area in which he reached out to them. And, you know, while he talks about a better politics, there were several times where, it, you know, he took some shots at one point. He talked about infrastructure, which is an area where they could agree. But then he says, we need to think bigger than one pipeline, kind of giving them a, a shot about Keystone. Or when he said, this is my last election, and some Republicans uh, clapped, as I suspect he expected them to. He said, yeah, I know, because I won both elections. I think those were the kind of gotcha moments that he said we shouldn't engage in. Mm -hmm. uh, we will, of course, be having the Republican response, and we'll cover that live here on this Fox station. Uh, that will begin five minutes after the president leaves the room. Speaking of the room, our correspondent Shannon Bream is inside the chamber. Shannon, to you. All right, Shepard. Well, I think it's interesting. We heard a couple of things tonight where there could be some common ground. You talked about most of what we heard from the president will not be warmly received, and we got reactions all throughout the speech, primarily from the House Speaker's office, John Boehner, of course, a Republican, uh, rebutting what the president had to say about many things. But one thing we know for sure, the president asked for authorization for military force, use of military force with regard to fighting ISIS or ISIL. Uh, they differ a bit on the language. What I've heard from folks on both sides of the aisle consistently in that room tonight were that they want to hear from the president about what he wants in an authorization. They want to give it to him. They're waiting for guidelines. There's been some speculation about why the president hasn't provided that yet, that it would commit the, the administration to a specific strategy, to outlining exactly what our purpose is and how they'll be combated. So he calls for that authorization, both sides saying, we want to give it to you. Come to us with specifics. Also talking about tax reform, as Chris pointed out and you talked about earlier, uh, the president teeing up $320 million 
dollars in things that would amount to tax cuts, but of course have to be funded somewhere else. And talking about closing the inheritance tax loophole and raising taxes on the wealthiest Americans. Well, uh, we know we're going to hear from the GOP response from the freshman Senator Joni Ernst about the fact that she's going to call on the president and say, we too want to close loopholes. We want to talk about tax reform. It's something that we can do together. So let's meet in the middle on that. Something that she will say, we think, that will be different than what we heard from the president is she won't gloss over that midterm election that uh, we just had that was very successful for the GOP. Uh, we expect her to say, hey, listen, voters, we heard from you. Uh, they're the ones that sent her to the U.S. Senate. She's going to say, we heard from you that Washington is on the wrong track. We're here to change it, and we're going to listen to you. So a bit of a different tone we'd expect from her in just a few minutes, Shep. And we'll look forward to that. Shannon Green, thanks very much. You know, I, I think one of the things we haven't talked about much is foreign policy, although uh, Shannon did mention the authorization for the use of force. I think a lot of people are, and, and not just Republicans, a lot of people on both sides of the aisle are going to say the president's optimism and that we have, in effect, turned the corner in the war on terror is, is not going to be particularly well received. Yes, we're, we're, uh, have ended our formal combat role in Afghanistan, but we're going to keep 10,000 troops there for the next year, 5,000 the following year. And of course, we're back, having said that we were going to get out of Iraq. We're back in Iraq. Uh, the situation with ISIS is, is very bad, very serious. We really aren't making serious gains on them. There have been some estimates that for all the, the soldiers that we kill in ISIS, they actually get even more recruits and have more troops uh, than they had when we started this fight. So I think his optimism in kind of declaring victory, or as some people are saying, mission accomplished, a la George W. Bush, is not going to be especially well received when it comes to foreign policy, Chef. This on a day when Yemen is in collapse, uh, Yemen once held up as a model for how we would handle things. This morning, rebels stormed the presidential palace there and overran the capital city. Uh, and there's very little mention of any of that, uh, at least w when compared to the others within this speech. Somewhat surprising, I think, except that the White House told us you won't hear any new policy initiatives tonight. We're going to look ahead. We're going to talk about our accomplishments over the past six years. And this matter of ISIS or ISIL and the hot spots and problems around the world, just a cursory glance, it seemed to me, Chris. Well, that's right. And, and I don't know any serious military person who thinks that the policy we have now, which is a coalition of airstrikes, no U.S. boots on the ground in a combat role, uh, talking about years to train up a free Syrian army to oppose ISIS on the ground in Syria. I don't know anyone who thinks that that is going to work either in the long, uh, short term or in the long term. You talk about things he didn't mention. Also, today, Iran made a, a, a military a defense pact with Russia. So for all of the talk about the isolation of Iran and about the, the, the bad shape and how isolated uh, Vladimir Putin is, uh, you know, there's another side to that story as well. This is uh, mandated, not that the president come and speak to Congress, but that from time to time he update the Congress on the State of the Union. Uh, you can make the argument that all of his policy initiatives were already put out there before tonight, and that maybe what we had tonight was a bit of a campaign sort of event. Is, has this exercise lost its way in modern America, or is this worthwhile? I mean, I don't know. The, the end of this speech seemed to me inspiring, and maybe that's something that all of us need. I don't know. Well, look, and I'm probably going to get in trouble on the Fox Network for saying yeah. it, but for a two hours or an hour and a half on a, on a Tuesday night, I think this is probably better than what you might see in entertainment programming. So I think it's a useful thing. I, I will say that I think yeah, by the you're six, in trouble. But I'm probably on. in trouble. Uh, I'm going to hear from Hollywood. But for the, in the sixth or seventh year of a presidency, it does get a little tired. And, and you know, when, when a new president comes in and he's, he or she is unleashing a new program uh, and, and there's a sense of real movement. Uh, but I think that that by this point in a presidency, it, be, it does begin to get a little tired. And I think the White House recognized that. And that's one of the reasons that instead of waiting and, and releasing all of this during the speech, which is the way it's traditionally done, he basically has been campaigning on this platform for the last two weeks uh, around the country. We heard over the weekend about the tax increases and the tax cuts for the middle class. We heard about community colleges. We heard about the, the child care credits. So, so none of this is new. 
and and I think to some degree it, it was because they recognized that uh, you, you can't just wait for this speech because you're not going to get the attention that you would get or as he got in the first years of his presidency. This I believe in the six years of his presidency is the longest that he has stayed inside the chamber and I mention that for reasons that I'm about to explain. The bottom of your screen it says soon the Republican response. Well here is how the Republican response works. From this moment, that moment, that very moment when he walked out of the building, from that moment a timer begins and we are five minutes away from the Republican response. He stayed in the chamber longer than he ever has before, which pushes the Republican response to 26 minutes past 10 o'clock on the East Coast. Half time of the evening news on most of these Fox stations. I don't know if that was deliberate or not, but it was certainly the effect. Well, you would suggest that would seem to contravene his call for a better politics and be one of those gotcha moments that the president was saying that he didn't think we should engage in. Well, I, I wasn't saying that's what happened. I just said it was that if the one is a cause and one is an effect. <laughs> no, I think you're probably exactly right. Uh, and, you're, you know, you've got to wait to hear Joni Ernst. I'm sure she's going to be well worth waiting for. But, uh, it, but I have to say also, I was kind of impressed at the fact that somebody gave their tie up for the president to autograph. Would you give your tie to have him autograph? Uh, probably. The ties, we are long on ties at the Fox News Channel. You know, Joni Ernst is giving the Republican response in just a moment. And Shannon Bream, Shannon, if I remember, you covered her campaign extensively. And she, it, it's interesting to me that she is now and has been a Tea Party favorite. And yet tonight, the Republicans will offer the response with a Tea Party favorite in Joni Ernst. And then the Tea Party will offer a response in, an, in that of another Tea Party member. Unusual time. Yeah, and I. Yeah, and I think that it highlights the fact that there are schisms within both parties. But right now, uh, there seems to be a public exposure to what's going on within the GOP. Joni Ernst, though, was one of those who was very much embraced by the Tea Party. She is a lieutenant colonel in the Iowa National Army, uh, Army National Guard. She has served overseas and been a leader in places like Iraq. So she has a very unique understanding about a lot of these issues uh, that the president has talked about and a lot of the foreign policy issues that we're going to have to continue to deal with and that the Congress is going to have to find a way to work with the president and vice versa. Uh, we heard tonight again, he talked about something we've heard quite a bit about in recent weeks about Iran. Uh, we know that uh, the administration continues its negotiations with a looming June 30th deadline over Iran's nuclear program. Tonight, the president took some credit saying, we've actually stopped advancement of their program. There are plenty of skeptics around the world who don't necessarily agree that that's the case. He has also again publicly warned lawmakers, don't come up with another round and pass another round of potential sanctions. Oh, well, we lost the feed. We've lost the feed from Shannon there. They're working off a, a wireless camera and microphone feed, and I figure it's going to come back together, and as, as soon as it does, we'll get to it. But I, I do want to go ahead and talk about the Republican response. Joni Ernst, uh, if she, she is a, on paper, a very qualified spokesperson uh, for all of the things she's about to discuss. They sent out a, a leaflet tonight showing uh, her State of the Union shoes. They are camo. Uh, oh, really? And, yes. And she, <laughs> she is one who... Uh, is very pro-security and will deliver the kind of message that I think most Republicans will want to hear. Well, uh, to folks who may not uh, be familiar with her, she was one of those Republicans who ran. It was a, an open seat. Tom Harkin, the longtime liberal Democratic senator, retired. She was in a tough race. Iowa had never elected a woman, believe it or not, to statewide office, either local in the state or federal. Uh, and she was famous because she... Uh, had been a hog farmer and she had been involved in, I guess the proper word is fixing hogs. And she said when she came to Washington, she was going to make them squeal. And that became her, her campaign line. And I'm sure the choice of, of her, as opposed to, let's say, Speaker Boehner or Mitch McConnell, as the new majority leader, is to put a woman out there, to put a fresh face out there. She's one of the new freshman class. Uh, and, and to say, we've got new ideas. We're, we, we are the party of. of of progress in the future, and uh, we're going to present as as helpful an agenda the mid, as a, to the middle class as Barack Obama is just going to be done a different way. Shannon Bream back with us again. Shannon, uh, Joni Ernst has has made the point repeatedly: we can govern, we will govern. Watch us govern. And I think they've got a lot to prove, especially going into 2016, because if you think about the fact that now, of course, the Republicans control both houses of Congress and the Democrats uh, are taking over the, and can continue to control the White House, they've got to find some middle ground. Jeff. So the Republican response is on the way from the, uh, from the freshman GOP senator from Iowa, Joni Ernst. As Shannon mentioned, she's a lieutenant colonel and battalion commander in the Army National Guard, served as a company commander in the Iraq War. 
She's also the first woman, as, as Chris mentioned, ever to represent Iowa in Congress. According to her office, Senator Ernst plans to tell Americans that the new Republican leaders in Congress, quote, heard the message you sent in November loud and clear, and now she says we're going to get to work to change the direction of Washington and the direction that it's been taking our country. Now, the Republican response to the State of the Union from Joni Ernst, the senator from the state of Iowa. Good evening. I'm Joni Ernst. As a mother, a soldier, and a newly elected senator from the great state of Iowa, I am proud to speak with you tonight. A few moments ago, we heard the president lay out his vision for the year to come. Even if we may not always agree, it's important to hear different points of view in this great country. We appreciate the president sharing his. Tonight, though, rather than respond to a speech, I'd like to talk about your priorities. I'd like to have a conversation about the new Republican Congress you just elected and how we plan to make Washington focus on your concerns again. We heard the message you sent in November loud and clear, and now we're getting to work to change the direction Washington has been taking our country. The new Republican Congress also understands how difficult these past six years have been. For many of us, the sting of the economy and the frustration with Washington's dysfunction weren't things we had to read about. We felt them every day. We felt them in Red Oak, the little town in southwestern Iowa where I grew up and am still proud to call home today. As a young girl, I plowed the fields of our family farm. I worked construction with my dad. To save for college, I worked the morning biscuit line at Hardee's. We were raised to live simply, not to waste. It was a lesson my mother taught me every rainy morning. You see, growing up, I had only one good pair of shoes. So on rainy school days, my mom would slip plastic bread bags over them to keep them dry. But I was never embarrassed because the school bus would be filled with rows and rows of young Iowans with bread bags slipped over their feet. Our parents may not have had much, but they worked hard for what they did have. These days, though, many families feel like they're working harder and harder with less and less to show for it, not just in Red Oak, but across the country. We see our neighbors agonize over stagnant wages and lost jobs. We see the hurt caused by canceled health care plans and higher monthly insurance bills. We see too many moms and dads put their own dreams on hold while growing more fearful about the kind of future they'll be able to leave to their children. Americans have been hurting, but when we demanded solutions too often, Washington responded with the same stale mindset that led to failed policies like Obamacare. It's a mindset that gave us political talking points, not serious solutions. That's why the new Republican majority you elected started by reforming Congress to make it function again. And now we're working hard to pass the kind of serious job creation ideas you deserve. One you've probably heard about is the Keystone Jobs Bill. President Obama has been delaying this bipartisan infrastructure project for years, even though many members of his party, unions, and a strong majority of Americans support it. The president's own State Department has said Keystone's construction could support thousands of jobs and pump billions into our economy and do it with minimal environmental impact. We worked with Democrats to pass this bill through the House. We're doing the same now in the Senate. President Obama will soon have a decision to make. Will he sign the bill? or block good American jobs. There's a lot we can achieve if we work together. Let's tear down trade barriers in places like Europe and the Pacific. 
Let's sell more of what we make and grow in America over there so we can boost manufacturing wages and jobs right here at home. Let's simplify America's outdated and loophole-ridden tax code. Republicans think tax filing should be easier for you, not just the well-connected. So let's iron out loopholes to lower rates and create jobs, not pay for more government spending. The president has already expressed some support for these kinds of ideas. We're calling on him now to cooperate to pass them. You'll see a lot of serious work in this new Congress. Some of it will occur where I stand tonight, in the Armed Services Committee room. This is where I'll join committee colleagues, Republicans and Democrats, to discuss ways to support our exceptional military and its mission. This is where we'll debate strategies to confront terrorism and the threats posed by Al-Qaeda, ISIL, and those radicalized by them. We know threats like these can't just be wished away. We've been reminded of terrorism's reach, both at home and abroad, most recently in France and Nigeria, but also in places like Canada and Australia. Our hearts go out to all the innocent victims of terrorism and their loved ones. We can only imagine the depth of their grief. For two decades, I've proudly worn our nation's uniform. Today, as a lieutenant colonel in the Iowa Army National Guard, while deployed overseas with some of America's finest men and women, I've seen just how dangerous these kinds of threats can be. The forces of violence and oppression don't care about the innocent. We need a comprehensive plan to defeat them. We must also honor America's veterans. These men and women have sacrificed so much in defense of our freedoms and our way of life. They deserve nothing less than the benefits they were promised and a quality of care we can all be proud of. These are important issues the new Congress plans to address. We'll also keep fighting to repeal and replace a health care law that's hurt so many hardworking families. We'll work to correct executive overreach. We'll propose ideas that aim to cut wasteful spending and balance the budget with meaningful reforms, not higher taxes like the president has proposed. We'll advance solutions to prevent the kind of cyber attacks we've seen recently. We'll work to confront Iran's nuclear ambitions and we'll defend life because protecting our most vulnerable is an important measure of any society. Congress is back to work on your behalf, ready to make Washington focus on your concerns again. We know America faces big challenges, but history has shown there's nothing our nation and our people can't accomplish. Just look at my parents and grandparents. They had very little to call their own except the sweat on their brow and the dirt on their hands. But they worked, they sacrificed, and they dreamed big dreams for their children and grandchildren. And because they did, an ordinary Iowan like me has had some truly extraordinary opportunities because they showed me that you don't need to come from wealth or privilege to make a difference. You just need the freedom to dream big and a whole lot of hard work. The new Republican Congress you elected is working to make Washington understand that too. And with a little cooperation from the president, we can get Washington working again. Thank you for allowing me to speak with you tonight. May God bless this great country of ours, the brave Americans serving in uniform on our behalf 
and you, the hardworking men and women who make the United States of America the greatest nation the world has ever known. Senator Joni Ernst with a Republican response to the State of the Union address tonight. Analysis now on Fox News Channel on satellite and cable and continuing coverage on your late local news on this Fox station, which on the East Coast and the Central Time Zone begins right now. For all of us at Fox News, I'm Shepard Smith in Washington. Good night. This has been a Fox News special presentation.